Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special foreign policy virtual dialogue on how to stop vaccine misinformation. My name is Ravi Agrawal. I'm the editor in chief of foreign policy, and it's my pleasure to be your host for the next hour. Now, let me just say this at the start. There is no more important topic in the world right now. As of today, 61% of adults in the United States have had at least one vaccination. Given where we were just three months ago, that's a huge success. But vaccine rates are now slowing. And that's because even now, there are enough people out there who don't have the facts or worse, they don't trust the facts. They don't trust science. That's just in the United States. Worldwide, the problem could be worse. And the thing is for now, we don't even know because vaccines aren't available everywhere. But once they do become available, we may face the same problem. There are many people in many parts of the world who don't trust vaccines. A lot of times what we see is that misleading information, conspiracy theories, and fear can exploit gaps in education, ethnic and racial divides, and a lack of trust in government. The worst off suffer most. All of this is awful because the only thing we know about this pandemic is that vaccines are the only way out. So what can we do? That is the question we're gonna try and answer today. What can the world do to understand what drives vaccine misinformation and how to effectively counter it? I have a superb panel to help us navigate this discussion. Guests from UNICEF, from Doctors Without Borders, and a couple of the world's top experts in communications. All of that's coming up first, I'd like to thank Northwestern University's Roberta Buffett Institute for Global Affairs for helping us make this event possible. And perhaps most importantly, a thank you to you, our audience, tuning in live from all over the world on Zoom and on social media. We've reserved a portion of this event for your questions. If you're on Zoom, click on the Q&A button. Please be sure to tell us your name, where you're writing from. If you're joining us on the phone or watching the live stream, uh, you can email us your questions at events at foreignpolicy.com. And of course, we encourage you to join the discussion on social media, hashtag stop vaccine misinfo. We really wanna hear from you and I'd love to incorporate your questions, your thoughts, into the discussion as we go along this hour. So join in. Okay, all of that said, let's get started. I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, uh, Melissa Fleming, the Under Secretary General for Global Communications at the United Nations, where she's been leading a global campaign to combat misinformation and help arm local communities with verified credible resources to make better informed decisions in the face of the pandemic. Melissa, welcome. Thank you very much, Ravi. Welcome um, for that welcome. And I'm really pleased to be here for this really timely and important discussion. Thanks, Melissa. Great to have you on board. Um, so <laughs> let's start with this. Um, just to lay out um, the stakes of what we're discussing, how bad is the problem with vaccine misinformation? It, it's it's really bad. Um, and we anticipated it also, which is kind of the shame. And I think uh, Angus Thompson is going to go into that more. but. It's bad, but it's been building um, and it's just shifted. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had different types of misinformation about the nature of the virus itself and uh, you know, wild uh, conspiracies about the origin of it, um, miracle cures uh, that were anything but um, wearing masks and washing your hands and, and, and doing what the health officials were telling us. Um, so we, you know, we, we knew that if and when a vaccine would be developed, we were going to get a spike in misinformation around the vaccines. And sure enough, in November, when the miracle of the vaccine was announced, not just one vaccine, but several vaccines that were safe and efficient and would, as you said in your introduction, be the way for us, the only way for us really to end this pandemic, uh, we saw a huge spike in misinformation uh, around, around the pandemic. And so what we have um, is, you know, WHO coined the term infodemic at the beginning of the pandemic. This infodemic has um, shifted now uh, its focus and the focus is around misinformation uh, um, around vaccines. It's around instilling fear in people, um, hesitancy, and even, you know, outright refusal uh, in mm -hmm. taking the vaccines. And so we have 
quite a battle. I'm really happy that you, the focus of this panel is going to be on solutions because there are ways um, to, to address it, but it certainly is uh, a polluted media landscape in which if you're somebody who is a bit just hesitant about, should I get the vaccine and, and um, or should I have my loved one vaccinated soon, my children vaccinated, when you go online, you're, the navigation is really confusing for many. It's, it's difficult. You're going to find different players. Um, and what we need is to really make sure that you know, front and center is the trusted science-based information so that people can inform themselves um, in, in a way mm. that will enable them to feel confident in this vaccine. So Melissa, I want to dig deep into solutions, but let's do that in a couple of minutes, because one of the things I wanted to ask you about as well before we get to solutions is just identifying the problem. And sometimes um, being able to identify a problem is, is half the battle won. So what is the most prevalent form of misinformation and who is it affecting most? Well, the problem is it's not, I guess it's not that simple because I mean, you do have, I, uh, there was a, a study that came out recently that identified uh, 12, only 12 uh, people um, who were really behind the most uh, spreading anti-vaccine information that was instilling the most, uh, you know, kind of fear and confusion out there. Um, very, you know, influential, um, really understanding how to work the platforms and their algorithms, uh, very clever about the way they were communicating the misinformation, um, really uh, through emotions, through stories, through taking data and distorting it just a little bit uh, to make it seem scientific and real. Um, so very, you know, it, you know, professional in the way that this was being done. And then, you, so, you know, in a way, it, it seems like it would be simple. I'll just go after those 12, which the, the platforms did. Uh, and yet those 12 have found clever ways of, you know, not even using the word vaccine, putting up a V instead. Um, it, it, there are, you know, very many ways around it. So there, are, one has to really look at the global level at how misinformation is traveling. Um, and we do know that, you know, it can be actors in the United States, and then you'll find it in small countries in Africa, the same misinformation. But also there is very unique uh, misinformation that is traveling, you know, just in one country or in one community that is also, also needs to be tackled and addressed. Mm -hmm. So there isn't really a kind of one-off solution, but there are several that I hope we'll explore that have to do sure. with, you know, actions by the platforms that have to do with building media literacy, which is something that we're working on at the UN through our verified initiative. Um, and there is the real need to be out there competing, um, be in those spaces where people are searching with uh, trusted verified information that is not a PDF document where people would have to search and on a page 136, find that nugget that they were looking for. No, sure. look at, be really, um, you know, out, aware of what people are searching for, the data deficits, and be instantly there with the answers based on science, mm -hmm. using in, you know, producing engaging content that travels as well as the misinformation travels, sure. or if not better. And what's clear to me from what you're saying is obviously this is a global problem. It is not just in developed markets or just in emerging ones. It is everywhere. There are local variants. Uh, in a sense, it is almost like a virus. Fake news is a virus. Um, and it spreads in, in um, unpredictable ways. Uh, and it's, it's like a game of whack-a-mole. Um, but before we get to solutions, um, I have to ask you this. Given that, as you pointed out, the WHO and others had predicted that this was going to happen, where have we failed? And by we, I mean global organizations such as yours. I mean journalists uh, and the media, which I represent, um, and, and world leaders. Where, where have we gone wrong? 
I think, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure if it's, if it's right to say where have we gone wrong, but where have we not perhaps done enough? Um, it is, it's such a big problem. Uh, and we already, it, it's, well, vaccine misinformation has existed since the beginning of vaccines. The problem is it's supercharged uh, by social media algorithms and the way information spreads now. Um, and this is I, a challenge. You know, we started re seeing it and recognizing it uh, when we were trying to promote climate science. Um, so this is not something entirely new, certainly anticipated, but a problem so big that we just, yeah, I think there's, there's more that we need to do um, to address it. There's more the platforms need to do, absolutely. And we as uh, public institutions need to be able to also advise the platforms on what we believe need, they need to do more on. But we do have the possibility as the United Nations, as public health uh, organizations to be better communicators, um, to make sure that our science-based content can travel as well as the misinformation can travel, um, that our trusted figures and you know the public health uh, uh, figures have in all surveys emerged as those people trust the most, uh, doctors and, and nurses and you know, people in the community that, uh, that provide advice. We need to equip them more to communicate better, to communicate science better. Science is often nuanced, it's changing. How can we communicate so that people say, okay, my, my fears are addressed, my questions are answered. So, you know, I, I wish I had a simple answer. Um, it's just that we need to be uh, doing definitely more. We need to be doing it more in, in more targeted ways. We need to be, as you said, the game of whack-a-mole. Um, we need to be better at playing it, being there where, how misinformation spreads. Misinformation spreads peer to peer. Um, how can we also be in those groups? Um, so the, the, just if I can, May, a couple of words on the initiative that we launched at the Please. United Nations um, at the beginning of this pandemic, when we recognized this was not just a public health crisis, but a communications crisis as well. We, together with the social mobilization organization called Purpose, uh, we partnered and launched an initiative called Verified. And the idea was um, not just to, to address misinformation by spreading misinformation literacy. We recruited information volunteers around the world and educated them about misinformation. We launched a campaign called Pause, which educated people to you really you know, be careful about what you share, take care before you share, look at the source. Um, Twitter and Facebook have actually followed with, um, I, I don't know if it was, it, it, they came to the same conclusion and have you know, put prompts when people are sharing articles, for example, without reading them. Uh, are you sure you wanna share that because you haven't read it? And so it's slowing the spread of misinformation through individual action. But what we've also done is we've taken that kind of boring science-based public health guidance and we have produced content that is cool, modern um, in multiple languages, uh, relevant in local communities and penetrating the groups that travel online well, and it's exciting for people to share. So um, this has been but, but can stuff like that be can stuff enough. like that be uh, can stuff like that be photoshopped? Um, part of the problem with social media today is it's so easy to to change imagery and then recirculate it. So how do you protect against that? Oh, that's interesting. That's the first time I've gotten that quite. We've seen a lot of photoshops um, and fake memes and things, but around our verified uh, content, we haven't seen any manipulation of it. Um, so it has been produced in such a way that um, it has really inspired media partners and influencers to take it and, and share it with their communities um, and to really get behind it. Uh, it is, we've had numerous uh, media organizations say, oh, we like that messaging. Um, we like the way it looks, the way it feels we'll rebroadcast it um, or we'll create public service announcements, you know, in this spirit. So I, I think that has, the value has been, there is 
everybody feels the urgency and the need um, who are those who want to stop the pandemic and who those who have influence on social media and we've given them the tools to help us. Um, so Still, let me ask you this, uh, Melissa, just done. moving moving forward in the next few months, because, I mean, th- this is so urgent, as you say. Um, right now, we have a situation where demand outstrips supply globally, not in the United States. Um, but there are people in much of the developing world who would love to get a vaccine, and they're simply not available. Um, when that flips, when de- when supply outstrips demand, and that's going to happen at some point, that's when we'll, we'll likely see large groups of people in the developing world, mostly now because they're the ones who are getting vaccines last, um, who may be holdouts. What is the strategy to make sure that there's no vaccine hesitancy in that group? This is such an important point, and I know this panel is going to discuss that uh, further, but it is so concerning on so many levels that the, the vaccine inequity that we've seen has in a way fueled vaccine hesitancy uh, because wow. you know, it, it was only available to, to rich nations um, and it still is to, to the largest extent, like most of the vaccines are 80% are in the 10 richest you know, nations and, and just in poorer countries, uh, there's very little available. But I think as Dr. Angus Thompson from, from UNICEF will say, even though there's small quantities in some developing countries or in, in countries in Africa, there's already huge hesitancy. So even if those small minority of people were offered the vaccine, um, I, just, I just saw a piece about um, Uganda trying to roll out the vaccine to refugees, um, which is wonderful. This is the policy that we at the UN have been pushing for, include all communities, include refugees, and those refugees have been hearing crazy rumors. They're, they're on social media and they're like, hey, I don't know if I want to take this thing. I have enough problems of my own. So right. in a way, you know, we need to recognize also, it's not just a question of we need to make sure the whole world has enough supply and can get vaccinated. It's a huge public effort, a huge effort that, that is needed to prepare people for when the vaccine is being rolled out in developing and poor countries, that people are going to want to take it. Um, we can't so just if, assume if I that would have pushed you on to. that, if I would have pushed you on that, Melissa, what would be the the two or three steps at the UN level um, that you can push, that your organization can push to ensure that countries have what they need um, to convince their populations to vaccinate? Um, first of all. You know, we ha- we we can't. We we hope that at the government level, there will be messages sent, and that that goes a long way. When you have a government that is promoting vaccines, where leaders are showing themselves getting vaccinated, where mm-hmm. influencers in the country are touting the importance of vaccine to end the pandemic, um, that is not a given in every country, unfortunately. And this is where the UN needs to step in um, and be that uh, and play that leadership role uh, to demonstrate the importance of the vaccine. But we also have to recognize that in many countries, conflict effect, affected countries, countries where people are struggling with poverty and other huge issues, it's, it's really interesting to see, or in other diseases, people are saying, oh, COVID-19, you know, Okay, that's one problem. They're not feeling it as 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 um, as much as as we are in many communities. So we need to really work with community leaders and 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 not do a kind of one size fits all approach um, to the world. Mm-hmm. It's it we're seeing different um, hesitancies, different conspiracies, different worries, different concerns, depending on where we're working. And so our country teams and our communications teams um, in every country in the world are now teaming up and need to do a lot more to make sure that we're addressing specific concerns of mm. that people have in those communities and that we're not just you know making assumptions everybody wants the vaccine of course i mean look at you know we're even exp- i'm here in the us and yes it's been amazing the numbers of people who are vaccinated, but then where we're, what we're facing now is a group of people who are 
absolutely refusing, very reluctant. And the government, the Biden administration, understanding the need to really do a, a, a local community-based approach. And I think that's what we need all over the world. We need grassroots organizations, faith groups, local health pr practitioners, small business owners, from the barbershop owner, maybe to the local restaurant, uh, depending on who the trusted voices are. Um, these are the people who need to be mobilized, equipped. Um, and yeah, um, centralized messaging is probably not going to work that well sure. at this stage. I have a question about trust, um, you know, because so much of the problems we've seen with vaccine hesitancy is based on a lack of so societal trust. I mean, at the community level, people not trusting, not just science, but not trusting their leaders, not trusting doctors, not trusting uh, their communities. Um, some of this has to do with, you know, conspiracy theories in general, but some of it just deep down is a lack of trust. I mean, think of how, you know, people in Pakistan and rural communities feel let down. Uh, they don't trust vaccines because, um, obviously because of the CIA's campaign once a long time ago, um, you know, where people were being swabbed uh, um, as they were looking for Osama bin Laden. Uh, other countries have other examples of reasons why um, people don't always trust uh, um, vaccines or, or they lose trust in government. Um, I want to ask a question from Ankit Kandelwal, one of our viewers, um, and he says a lot of confusion is created because of a lack of cohesive voices from, from the health community. And he says that statistics provided by health experts, uh, some who are doctors, some who may not be, um, have created confusing narratives and social media has added to the fuel with a lack of clarity on how vaccines work. Um, so I guess his question is, what can you do about that? Well, um, I think that this is really an issue that uh, very often scientists and public health officials are, you know, they're not necessarily the best communicators. And it's also the nature of science. And you've seen it in this pandemic. Uh, it shifts um, and it changes. And you have to be a really strong communicator to explain that shift and to understand that you need to be transparent um, and and really to you know to get out the info why things have changed why remember at the beginning of the pandemic mask wearing wasn't recommended and then that shifted and, and that really needs to be explained in order to build public trust um, it's really important and that's why again you know there's only so much you can do at a global global level even at a national level but to really understand and to break down um, through polling, um, an understanding of what mm. people are mistrustful of and why. Um, you, you know, as you'll recall in the United States, and I think um, also in the UK, at the beginning of the vaccine rollout, there was a big concern that it was going to be the African-American community um, that was going to be the holdout, that they, because of the history of experimentation and huge inequalities in health in healthcare, um, that, that they were going to be the ones uh, that were going to be the holdouts. And, you know, much was done to build their confidence um, in this vaccine through using community leaders, trusted messengers, religious leaders. And it actually is a, a different group um, that has turned out to be the real vaccine hesitant. And those are um, followers of the former president, uh, Trump. So what is the issue? Why are they hesitant? Um, is it is it because they actually just can't even, can't access the vaccine because it's too much of a pain to get there and then they'd have to take a day off work? Um, is it because they were exposed to some social media that made them fear that it's going to you know, affect their DNA or fertility or, these are all valid questions that people have because they have been exposed um, to misinformation and what, what they really need is, you know, their doctor, their GP, their, their own trusted figure. And it's really not for us to, to know who exactly everyone trusts that community in sure. Pakistan, who is it, but there are ways to find out. And then there are ways to equip those trusted figures, uh, with, uh, exactly. ways to communicate that is going to build trust and confidence in this vaccine.
Exactly. You know, and if I may, um, as a journalist, as someone who um, oversees a team of journalists and also um, has to oversee corrections from time to time that run in our magazine, one thing that I've learned is admitting to a mistake is, is a great way to build trust. So even, you know, no matter the profession, when, when one is able to say, we got this wrong, or what, what, we, what we said earlier was based on the information we had, now the information has evolved, this is what our current advice is, being as transparent as possible, I think, um, engenders trust. Uh, Melissa, thank you so much for your time. Uh, uh, Ravi, may great I to add hear. something there? Please and just do. Plug the role of of traditional media because I think we've talked a lot about social media, but I think and I really hope that this pandemic will uh, recognize the role of public interest media. Unfortunately, which is uh, is really um, facing extinction because of the financial uh, issues, but but that really the role of of uh, of the public interest media has been recognized as being there to provide well-researched uh, information that is trustworthy uh, for the public to help them navigate through times of crisis, especially in a time of, 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 of a pandemic. So thank you also for what you do at, at Foreign Policy. You're very kind to say that. Uh, thank you for what you do, Melissa. Um, it's great to have you um, on this event. Melissa Fleming there, the Under Secretary General for Global Communications at the United Nations. Okay, um, we have lots more ahead. As I mentioned, we have a terrific panel coming up uh, and I see many of your questions coming in. I promise to put those to our panelists. Um, but before we get to our panel, I wanna welcome our next speaker, uh, Annalise Riles, she heads Northwestern University's Roberta Buffett Institute for Global Affairs. Northwestern, of course, um, is, is backing this event and, and running it with us. Um, so Annalise, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Thank you, Ravi. Great to have you again. Um, so, um, you know, we clearly need to train our leaders uh, around the world um, on how to better stop the spread of misinformation and disinformation. And as Melissa and I were talking, I mean, this is a game, an evolving game of whack-a-mole that gets more and more complicated. Um, and it's hard. It's hard to deal with misinformation and disinformation. And it's hard for leaders, especially young leaders, to figure out ways to combat a problem that seems to metastasize, um, you know, every time there's a crisis. So. Tell us about the role that universities such as yours um, can play in training and educating the next generation of policymakers. So I think uh, universities, higher education institutions can really be a critical part of the solution to this problem. Um, first of all, we can teach critical thinking skills and critical media consumption skills. And let me tell you, Ravi, our students are clamoring for this. Um, and not just uh, in the United States, around the world. And they're actually leading efforts to share these skills beyond the university walls with the community at large. Uh, for example, this year, uh, a group of our graduate students at the Northwestern University Medill School of Journalism launched a COVID-19 analyzer to fight misinformation. And the analyzer is an interactive database they created that allows users to research stories or public statements or social media posts and to see them listed as true, mixed, or false, accompanied by links and further information. Um, but beyond that, we also need good media consumption practices. And we need, um, beyond that, we also need um, new kinds of media that fit the moment. And we, you and Melissa were talking um, so importantly about the diverse needs and interests of different communities. And here too, I think universities can be part of the solution because we're collections of incredibly creative, skilled mm. people who are not so directly beholden to the market. So um, our faculty and students, for example, are working on all kinds of creative alternative platforms from new media companies that aim to short circuit the market driven studios and streaming platforms to crowdsourced news organizations that attempt to evade authoritarian regimes or organized crime syndicates um, that are mis sharing misinformation um, by uh, bringing together journalists and academics. And, and I think the third thing is we need to invest in research. We need to understand that 
um, we have to understand this changing media landscape in a global framework to address it, just like we got to understand the virus to fight it. And um, so we've been talking a lot about the needs uh, for local solutions today to uh, sharing information globally. And I, and I want to say, I think one of the things that's really special about universities, Ravi, is that they are they are really strong in this space because we as universities are so locally rooted. You know, you were talking about those trusted local uh, sources of information, whether it's religious authorities or corporates or local shops. Our universities are really connected and on the whole quite respected in their local communities. But we're also incredibly globally networked. We're interconnected with each other. We're sharing information. We're sharing folks um, all the time. And so we can be a, a source for that kind of flexible, global, local media knowledge. And for example, um, Northwestern serves as the secretariat for the U7 Plus Alliance of World Universities, which aims to work with governments in the G7 in particular and beyond to address some of these problems. And we're working together to uh, find ways to leverage our collective strengths to combat misinformation across the network and ensure the free flow of information, bringing different expertise from different disciplines, but also different conceptions of the problem from different locations to study the media as a global actor on par with actors like the United Nations and figure out how we respond. Let me ask you this, Annalise, because you know, if, I, if there was a Venn diagram with two circles, circle one is people at universities, part of the university community, students, professors. And the second circle was um, people who want to take uh, a vaccine. I would imagine, I could be wrong, but I would imagine that these two circles would align pretty closely. So um, given that that's the case, um, how would a university such as yours or an initiative such as yours broaden the circles, reach out to people who are outside uh, of the Venn diagram I'm describing? Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that. Um, I think that's probably true. On the other hand, um, you know, universities are diverse collections of folks or people who have connections to a lot of local communities. And of course, the more diverse the university, the stronger it is in this respect, the stronger, you know, I may be uh, uh, a university professor uh, as I am in Chicago, but my family is from a rural part of the United States and I have relatives in those parts and I'm connected to those folks and I, I like them and respect them, even though I disagree with them. And so the more, um, the more diverse uh, we can be, the better those networks, um, the stronger those networks uh, can be. But also that's where research comes in because research is about understanding perspectives other than your own. And we have invested through this pandemic in the medical research. You know, we really understood the sky's the limit. We gotta spend whatever it takes to solve this problem. We need to invest in the research too around media to understand how it works and how people respond. We can do the same in that space. Fantastic. Annalise, thank you so much as always for your insights and for the work that you do supporting the fight against misinformation. Okay, um, let's proceed now with the panel that I promised. Um, uh, I have three excellent guests, uh, delighted uh, to have them with us today. Um, they are all practitioners on the front lines of communications and public health policy. So let's bring in uh, Dr. Carolina Batista. Uh, she's an international board member at Doctors Without Borders, also head of global health affairs at Baraka Impact Finance. Um, Pablo Bokchowski, he's professor at Northwestern University and Dr. Angus Thompson, senior social scientist, demand for immunization at UNICEF. Welcome to all of you. All right, I see you all. Great to have you with us. Um, let me start with um, Angus. Um, I wanna get a sense from you, um, just given the discussion you've heard so far, um, what are we missing? What are the two or three steps that are going to be the most important ones for us, for the world, to focus on in the coming months to ensure that we are able to defeat vaccine misinformation? Very good question, Ravi. Um, in a sense, we're here because of uh, something that Annalise touched upon. There's been a, we, we have, we've developed vaccines 
through some of the most incredible science. And these vaccines have been developed, you know, properly um, due to massive investment and the leverage of that science. We have the same science that can tell us how um, people understand vaccination, how we communicate with them about vaccination, how the communication ecosystem that they're in functions. And yet we've seen a massive underinvestment in that science, a lack of will to apply that science to the way we do things. And that's how we've ended up here. In the long term, and I think you've asked me a short term question, in the long term, we need investment. We need solid investment in this kind of, in the science that the cognitive and social sciences, the communication sciences, that tell us what it is that drives people's decisions to vaccinate. But your question was, what do we do now? The first thing we have to do is understand that it's not just misinformation. Misinformation can change people, people's attitudes. It can have an impact on their decisions. But a huge challenge that we also have is that people's questions and concerns, which are perfectly reasonable as, as, a, as both a biological scientist and, and, and a social scientist, I have plenty of questions about the vaccines at the moment. Right, we all do. But they're not being answered, right? Or, or oftentimes people are not finding the, the answers to their questions in a format that, that reassures them from someone that they trust. So in addition to understanding the misinformation, we need to understand what the concerns and questions are that people have. And that means social listening. I saw um, Christian Wepe in the, in the Q&A is doing social listening in Chile. Every country needs to start rapidly implementing social listening programs. And I'm not just talking about social media listening. Um, we've seen a gross inequity in vaccine distribution, there's also a gross inequity in information distribution as well. So that means listening into the mainstream media, social media, but also offline sources to understand better what are people's questions and concerns and to rapidly uh, fill those information gaps in addition to identifying the misinformation. Mm. Yeah. I think that's the first and biggest step that we have to take um, in order to restore some level of public confidence and also we, we tend to focus, Ravi, a lot on people who are um, quite strongly opposed to vaccines, but there are a lot of people who are just a little volatile, a little concerned, a little hesitant is the word we use, yeah. and, and that's fair enough. <laughs> um, right. And, and there's, and there's, no, there's nothing to be gained. There's nothing to be gained from shaming people who have valid questions. Absolutely. There's nothing to be gained from shaming anybody about anything. So the second thing we have to do once we understand what their questions are, Ravi, is we need to speak with people, not at them, about what concerns them, where they are, to the person that's in front of us, understanding where that person's coming from, understanding where they're getting their information and having their conversations, understanding what the questions and concerns are that they have. Mm -hmm. That means uh, sophisticated systems that allow you to plug, understand what your social listening is telling you and to start to shape um, the content, the responses to the questions, the inoculation messages to the misinformation. If we want to get into that, we can vaccinate people against misinformation and to get that out to people where they are. That means, as we've heard from Melissa, right out through the communities. This is not, this is not broadcasting, you know, to everybody, uh, one size fits all message. This is uh, community engagement right down at the, at the, you know, the smallest community level. Mm. Fascinating. I'd like to bring in Carolina. Um, Carolina, given your work at um, MSF, I'm curious um, for your take on how health messaging can best be tailored to sort of transcend educational gaps, racial gaps, uh, socioeconomic divides, geographic divides. Um, how do you begin to sort of manage that kind of challenge? Thank you, Ravi. It's a very important question. Uh, it's great to be here today. I think, first of all, it, it's really important to acknowledge the disproportionate impact of COVID in, in these communities and, and, and their historical experiences of, you know, mm -hmm. mistreatment and mistrust uh, with the biomedical community and, and sometimes the, the, the health provider. So first of all, understanding and acknowledging that so that we can and should engage with communities and community leaders and, and trusted uh, members of the community. And, you know, there are great examples out there. For example, I was recently speaking with, you know, people I know from indigenous communities way out in, in the remote villages of the Amazon. And they're using the radio, radio system to spread information in the local languages. You know, there are 20 different languages. So they're really tailoring that because we have mm. to make sure that we're counteracting those informations. And, and I think there are a lot of, of, of lessons to be learned 
uh, from, you know, as, as we're going along with the, the pandemic and really trying to understand that it's not um, by chance that, that people are, are hesitant and people are, are you know, mis, you know they, they have the mistrust, but we have to make sure that we, we address and, and, and not address to them, but work with them. And I think the best messages are always the ones that are developed and co-owned by the communities so that they have the sense of ownership and they can be the ones that disseminate in the way that makes sense to them and that, that's, that's uh, uh, you know, aligned with their beliefs, their understanding, their cultural and all of that. So I think once we, we understand that, we have to d design all of this with them. So it's gonna be much easier. And, and, and that's what the experience is showing. And then I think that Melissa brought this up as well, you know, engaging with the, not the usual suspects. I mean, of course we have to engage with the healthcare professionals and you know the people who work with the communities, the community leaders, et cetera. But sometimes you know, I've seen experiences, for example, in Brazil with neglected diseases like leprosy and, and the main success was working with barbers because they would spend time mm. you know, uh, shaving uh, the, the people and, and cutting hair. And then they would see, oh, maybe you have this lesion. And you know, so I think engaging with the known usual suspect is really a very important thing and, and engaging with people who can and, and, and communicate properly with these communities. I think there is only uh, that way that we can really properly address uh, effectively all of, of this misinformation that's targeted to these communities. Carolina, that answer really resonates for me. It makes so much sense. And I think, you know, so many times when we have um, leaders in powerful positions talk, it often seems like they can be talking down. And it's hard to trust, it's hard to build trust in that kind of a scenario. But when you have community leaders um, speaking to people as peers, um, I, I do think it's more likely that that, that is something that can build trust. Um, I wanna bring in Pablo because there is, however, the question of social media, which seems to upend uh, communities, which builds its own online anonymous communities. Um, and it's much harder to navigate how to build trust on social media and how to defeat misinformation on social media because it is um, so global. It is the opposite of communities. Um, it is communities that are amorphous. Um, Pablo, I know that you um, have done some work in this area. Um, you've worked on how um, Argentinians, for example, consume information on WhatsApp. Um, I'm curious um, for your take on how best to combat misinformation specifically that that goes viral on 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 social media platforms yes thank you very much Fabi. thank you first for the invitation um thank you uh, to foreign policy and to the buffett institute for having me here um social media is both global and local um, and it is received, even though viral messages circulate across the world, they are received differently by different people in different places. And in part, mm. they are received differently because they resonate with different experiences. So far, we've been talking a lot about the role of information and misinformation, but we've been talking less about the role of experience, what something has, someone has experienced before and how that shapes how they received information now. So um, on social media, it's no different in a sense uh, than uh, outside of social media. And in that sense, Angus and Carolina uh, have touched upon very important points. Uh, it is about the local experience. It is about finding the local influencers. It is about, uh, as Angus said, not only looking at people who are extremely you know, uh, on the extreme end of vaccine hesitancy, but who might be in the middle. And therefore, mm -hmm. from a practical standpoint now, they are the low hanging fruit in terms of persuasion, right? And it's important, I mean, what we found in our research is that it's important to understand that very few people are completely anti-vaxxers. People uh, like this vaccine, but don't like that vaccine, or like this vaccine for my kids, but not for myself. Or I used to take that vaccine for many years, but I don't take it now. Um, right. and, and those are the low hanging fruits now in terms of the communication effectiveness of a persuasion campaign on social media and outside of social media. Fascinating. I want to keep encouraging our viewers around the world. We have many hundreds um, right now across time zones who are watching this um, uh, and many thousands more will watch a recording of this later. Um, but please do keep sending in your questions, uh, the Q&A button on Zoom 
or events at foreignpolicy.com. Um, I'm going to start asking some of your questions now um, because I, I think the fact that so many of you are in different parts of the world um, than uh, the typical New York, D.C. set um, that can often be part of this conversation is very important. So Hiro Saito from Ethiopia um, has a question um, that goes, um, so Hiro works in Africa as a communications officer and says that there are rumors going around on WhatsApp, communicating the right messages on WhatsApp is key in the fight against inf uh, the infodemic. So Hiro's question is, how can we monitor fake news and identify rumors on WhatsApp? Is there a systematic method? How can we identify the origin and the sources of negative and false messages related to COVID-19? Um, I'm gonna throw this out there. Um, Angus, perhaps, would you like yeah. to take this on? Go for it. So I think as, as most people know, WhatsApp is a closed platform. So we can't, we can't monitor WhatsApp and we can't you know, interact with WhatsApp. Um, but we do know that it's a very, very important uh, platform in many, many countries, a platform that provides, you know, the majority of Brazilians with their news and a platform that people interact with, therefore a platform um, upon which a lot of misinformation. And more importantly, and we haven't said this yet really uh, clearly, Ravi, but disinformation. So disinformation has deliberately right. created misinformation. It's created with malicious intent and with deceitful tactics uh, for profit motives, for political motives. Let's let's get that clear. It's important also because this is what brings us to some of the solutions down the track. So the answer is we can't monitor WhatsApp. Um, therefore, it really it really comes to each country uh, to decide uh, whether they have people who are who are in the WhatsApp groups that are starting to track this kind of information. This brings certain ethical concerns, um, but at the same time. I think you know it can be justified because you can those people can also be picking up the questions and concerns that people might be communicating on WhatsApp and be in a position to address those as well. The great answer. And thank you for the for mentioning the distinction between mis and disinformation. Um, Cecilia Toledo has a question. Again, I'm going to throw this out there um, for any of you three to take it on. Um, she says, great discussion. How do you think smaller countries can help in the fight against misinformation, being places where we can better test communications and confidence projects? Carolina, perhaps? Yes, I can take that. That's a, that's a very important question. And I think, you know, we can think of smaller countries, but also we can apply that to maybe smaller communities and, you know, like remote communities. And I think they're a great way to, again, work on positive messages. And I think we, 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 we haven't touched upon that enough uh, today. And I think that's a, that's a great way of piloting how to counteract the misinformation and the disinformation campaigns that are out there. And I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm Brazilian and I've seen the impact of WhatsApp uh, groups, for example, targeting, mm -hmm. you know, uh, remote communities, uh, indigenous communities, uh, you know, people who live very remotely. And, and it really taps into their pre-existing fears and, 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 you know, reluctance with the, the, the system and, and the structural racism and, 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 you know, inequalities that they face in a daily day-to-day -day life. So I think those, those messages really target and, and tap into that. So I think it's time to do the reverse. Let's work on the positive messages and known accusatory and, and you know, creating positive environments and, and messages that empower those communities. And, and I think that would be a great way, for example, for smaller countries, but also for smaller communities to test uh, those approaches and really build what kind of messages make sense. And again, using the channels, the communication channels that are most used by these communities. It doesn't matter if you mm. make like a newsletter or, you know, as Melissa was saying, like a PDF that will not never mm. reach the community. So, mm. you know, if these communities communicate on WhatsApp, and again, I think it's important to say that for many of these communities, WhatsApp and, and, and mobile phones are the connection with the, the world. Right. Usually these are the first access they have to newspapers, to magazines, to social media. And a lot of times, you know, at least in, in some of the countries that I've been to, you know, the, 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 the phone companies, they have a special uh, package that you don't need to pay to use WhatsApp, for example, or Facebook or social media. So it really enables these communities to use that. Uh, very much. I mean, with, with totally. no limits, basically. And, and this right. really is an opportunity, but at the same time, it fuels a lot of, you know, uh, misguidance and, 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 uh, and, and misinformation and, and disinformation. So I think 
piloting these ideas and working with communities, working with the different uh, levels of, of, of community leaders and, and working with the elderly at the same time also, I think the youth has a major role to play there, mm -hmm. you know, like working with the schools and, and building uh, messages and, and communication strategies with the youth, they have definitely, you know, an influence in their parents and the elderly in the communities, I, right? So I, I couldn't agree so more. To be done there. Yeah. Yeah, I you know, I mean, obviously you're from Brazil. Second, Ravi? Oh, please do. Yes, jump in. Yeah, thanks, Carolina. Um, there are also, you know, there are positive side to, to social media as well. Mm -hmm. you, you asked, what can we do now? So, you know, what Carolina is saying is the ideal, that we, we co-construct the communications, the, the responses to people's questions with communities, but that takes time. Um, but every retail company in the world is rapid A-B testing content to understand what resonates with people, what gets people's attention, what um, people respond to. And that in, that's testing content, not just for the, for the actual words, but for the, mm. the look, the design, the tone, the framing of the messages. And so we're working with um, the Yale Institute of Global Health and Public Good Projects to do this, exactly this, on social platforms. We develop with our colleagues in the countries uh, to support their campaigns content and then we rapid A-B test it for the look, for the, for the messenger, et cetera, to see what is it that, that people respond to. And that allows us in this kind of urgent situation to perhaps get beyond the, you know, one size fits all and, and get down to a community level, albeit, you know, as Pablo was referring to, online community level um, with, with content that's in a form that may resonate with people and may help address their questions and concerns. Over. That's fascinating. You know, um, as I was listening uh, both to Angus and to Carolina, um, Carolina mentioned Brazil, I, you know, I'm from India and um, I ended up writing a book about this because I was so fascinated by the uptake of WhatsApp in India. India has the most WhatsApp users in the world. Um, but the smartphone here is just fascinating because for most people in the developing world, the smartphone is their first computer, their first radio, their first MP3 player, their first internet device, their first map, their first so many different things in one. It's, it's a Swiss army knife of a device and, and it is both immensely powerful for good but also for bad. And, 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 and that's why it's such a challenge to be able to regulate it in some form, but to understand it in some form. And as, as you've all been saying, if we are to look to solutions, we have to go to where people are, which really in this case is, is more and more social media. I want to bring in Pablo, um, because one thing that several of our viewers have been asking, um, I'm going to cite uh, Robert Downing, um, who's asked about this. I have uh, another um, um, viewer um, who wished to remain uh, anonymous uh, in Uganda um, asking about education. And this is sort of more of a longer term question, um, but there's the, the question of, should, should we adopt science curricula in schools in, in developed and developing countries to ensure that the next generation of, of people are um, more amenable to science and to vaccine technologies, um, that we boost media literacy. Um, more specifically, Robert Downing's question is that it's vital that objective informed sources gain a stronger, more trusted position in social media. Um, how do, we, how do we elevate the aggregate voice of experts to overwhelm the bad or just plain misinformed actors in social media? Um, so Pablo, let me bring you in and if you have thoughts on any of the questions I just raised. Thank you, Ravi. Yes, we should definitely uh, boost uh, you know, scientific education, scientific literacy and media literacy across all levels from kindergarten uh, onwards. But we have to do it in a way building on what you, Angus and Carolina were saying, meets people where people are at today. If we are interacting on the screen, we know a few things already that work and a few things that don't. Uh, number one, people spend very little time on average on any given screen, 12 seconds on a computer screen between five and, five and seven seconds on a cell phone screen, which means that the messages have to be designed so that they can be consumed between five and 12 seconds, mostly between five wow. and seven seconds. Number one. Number two, we know that one of the main drivers of virality, as you, since you asked before, has to do with emotionality. 
people you know, process information not only with their brains, but also with their hearts. So we need to tap into that. We need to communicate in ways that is not called scientific information, but that taps into positive emotions. So that makes people sort of engage with that. And I wholeheartedly uh, support Angus's practice of A-B testing constantly for anything that will go uh, online. So if we design science curriculum, if we redesign science curriculum for our times, it has to be redesigned so that it can be consumed between <laughs> X number of seconds and those other number of seconds in short increments, building uh, quickly one on the other uh, unit of uh, information, breaking things up and making information that can be easily appropriated and lead to experiences because that's the other main driver mm. of attention and engagement on social media. Fascinating. I have a really interesting question from Donna Liger. Um, she says that she just returned from working with journalists in North Macedonia who told her that generalized messages about the safety of vaccines is not getting at the misinformation because the media is splintered into affinity and interest groups. So she says, for example, the popular online women's magazines are running articles that question the vaccine safety with regard to fertility. So what advice do you have for targeted messaging? Uh, I'll throw that out there. Any of you who'd like to answer, uh, Angus, Carolina, Pablo. I should have called on one of it's, you. It's a tricky Carolina. one when, when it's, it's a tricky one when it's, you know, the interest groups are so well um, circumscribed or defined, right? Um, there's something that we haven't touched upon and I'm, I'm concerned I may not directly answer Donna's question, but I do think it's really interesting and it, it does relate to this. So there's a science to how people um, process and um, uh, take on misinformation and we're able to, immunize people against misinformation. We now have tools that could allow us to build herd immunity to misinformation. And this comes um, via providing people with the skills to identify misinformation, to flag it, but importantly, to identify the underlying motivations of those who are creating the disinformation and, and the deceitful tactics that are being used. So Donna's question, for example, relating to a mis misinformation around vaccines affecting fertility. The question we should ask is, do we want to address that front on or do we want to help people understand that this mis disinformation is being, dis is being disseminated, created and disseminated for, for, for hidden, with hidden motives, that it's, it's out there because someone wants to make money or someone has a political motive. We know if we're able to do that, uh, we can inoculate people. There's, there's a, a game that's been tested in um, at least three trials now, randomised trials go viral. Um, that helps people... You play the game, you're the, you're the disinformation author, you're trying to fool people with all the different tactics that are, that are used. And at the end of that game, which is very quick and kind of fun, um, you've actually become more resistant to misinformation. I think this touches wow. also, Ravi, on the question we heard about education. And you know, we have countries like Finland, which have been um, working on this for 10 years and who now we see have a higher resistance at a national level to misinformation. Mm. So the solutions are out there but it takes investment. We need to be doing this at a population level. We need to be working to build that herd immunity to misinformation. Over. Absolutely. Um, Caroline, I'm wondering if you would like to take on some of Donna's answer uh, question, sorry. And while you're thinking about that, I also just wanna um, read out a question from Shefali Reiki, uh, who's in Singapore. Um, and she says, uh, the problem of infodemic seems widespread, particularly in Asia, where several countries are dealing with fresh waves of the virus and variants. And it ranges from just misinformation to conspiracy theories to sharing of inappropriate health remedies. How do you address the challenge in countries where digital literacy is far from desired levels and where older people or those in rural parts of the countries um, have just gotten online through smartphones? Um, Carolina, any thoughts on that or Donna's question? about specifically fertility related misinformation. Yeah, maybe some, some general thoughts on that. I think it's it's really important to um, to understand that you know we, we need also to push for consistent messaging, right? By by all the different stakeholders, by healthcare professionals, by policymakers, by governments, because we can only counteract all of this kind of misinformation if we have 
sound evidence-based scientific information out there. So if you have that, for example, then you don't, you know, if you, someone claims that vaccines will, um, you know, jeopardize fertility, then you have accessible or easily mm -hmm. accessible um, uh, scientific information and, and, um, and evidence uh, on that. So I think it's important to, to work on how to make that kind of information easily relatable to people so that it's, you know, if at least you're, you're becoming immune to this misinformation, as Angus was, was mentioning before, you can have the tools and the, you know, and access to very easy, uh, relatable, uh, digestible information on, oh, let me check if this is, this is true or not. So I think it's making that kind of information more uh, widely available, but really striving for uh, consistent messages, because it doesn't really help if you have all of that going on. And then you have governments that one day, you know, downplay the pandemic and, and say things that, you know, are not necessarily based on any uh, um, scientific evidence. So I think that's really important that we have all of those elements uh, together to create a strong foundation and, and empower people uh, to understand that they, they, they can make their, their healthy decisions themselves. That's a great point, uh, Carolina. Um, uh, I'd also like to ask our panelists to take a look at some of the questions in the Zoom chat. Terrific questions. Um, uh, there's one, one, one person is asking about uh, the game that, that Angus mentioned, if you're able to type it out uh, as an answer there. Done. I think that would be very helpful. Oh, you're, you're able to say it. Go for it. It's done. I've typed it in the answer. Oh, you have. Go Excellent. to the answer, answer questions. You've got two games there, actually. Oh, terrific. Well, um, I'll direct all of our um, viewers to the Zoom chat so they can see. One of the first things you're doing is evaluating what you're detecting and deciding, uh, first of all, whether it's mis or disinformation, which gives you an idea of your response, your potential response, but also you need to decide whether or not to respond, in particular with vaccine misinformation or disinformation. Because what we know uh, from a number of studies is that um, people who already are hesitant about vaccines will react very differently to content. And that content that we think is meant to reassure, reassure them and may even uh, help them understand that the measles vaccine doesn't cause measles will actually lead to a decreased intention to vaccinate. So we need to evaluate whether or not we're going to act against it. And then we need to decide what we're going to do. And you know, I touched upon generalized inoculation against mis or disinformation but we can also create debunks based on a science that will right. reduce the risk of that backfire, um, but will address certain disinformation narratives that we feel are getting traction, maybe having an impact on people's behaviours, maybe having an impact on public health. Got it. I'm afraid we are out of time. Uh, I just got a message. Uh, um, Angus, if you wouldn't mind just mentioning the name of the games and where people can find them. I'm not sure if everyone is able yeah. to look at the Zoom chat. Yep. So there's quickly. Go Viral, Go Viral, and there's also Cranky Uncle, um, which is uh, which are both two games. Go Viral has been tested in at least three studies, and and if people are interested in this, Ravi, um, UNICEF with PGP and and Yale Institute of Global Health published the Vaccine Misinformation Management Field Guide, which really covers the science behind what I've been saying to you, and helps countries establish a. a an operational framework, you know, a strategy to manage this, this issue. Fascinating. Well, I, I'm sure many of our listeners today will Google um, those games, look out for them and see if they can disseminate them in their communities. I know many of the people who've been watching today are working um, at NGOs at the rural level around the world, really. Um, so I'm sure many of the techniques, the names, the games, that you've all mentioned today will be very useful. I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Pablo Bokchowski, um, Dr. Carolina Batista, and Dr. Angus Thompson um, for their fascinating insights uh, and thoughts here today. Um, this has really been an interesting and informative conversation. I've learned a lot. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters through this hour um, for sharing their perspectives. And also thanks to you, our viewers from around the world, for participating, asking great questions, and for being interested in this topic. Uh, as I said, uh, there are few issues right now in the world that are as important as this one, making sure that everyone everywhere is vaccinated. That is the one way 
to end this pandemic. Big thanks again to Northwestern University's Buffett Institute for Global Affairs for partnering with us on convening this very important dialogue. It's the second installment in a series of conversations about the drivers and the impacts of fake news and what global leaders and institutions should do about it. Visit our event website to check out the previous one on fake news. Full recording is available in our archives at foreignpolicy.com slash events. Please stay tuned for much more to come from FP, including a virtual dialogue tomorrow on using geospatial images and satellite powered intelligence gathering to forecast threats and to help navigate disasters and humanitarian crises. That's tomorrow, May 26, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Be sure to check it out. More as always on foreignpolicy.com and foreignpolicy.com slash events. I'm Ravi Agrawal, Foreign Policy's Editor-in-Chief. It's been my pleasure to be your host this hour. Take care. Thank you for joining us and see you soon. Great job. Nice. Uh